Welcome to this week's View on Africa. I'm going to be speaking about recent developments with regards to South Africa, international criminal justice, and potentially the unending Al-Bashir debacle. In speaking about it, I'm going to speak to four key points. The first will be South Africa's relationship with the ICC. The second, South Africa as a broker of peace and reconciliation. The third, and obviously the elephant in the room, Al-Bashir's indictment, his visit to South Africa, and the last point, which will be the crux of my presentation, is whether there has been a shift in terms of South Africa's engagement on international criminal justice and what this really means. In essence, trying to answer the question as to why South Africa let al-Bashir go, and perhaps more importantly, does it really matter in the bigger scheme of things? So the first point in terms of South Africa and the International Criminal Court, South Africa's history is well known. South Africa comes from a history of apartheid, of oppression, and really of a fight for not just peace, but also of justice, of seeing that accountability is served for crimes committed. It was through South Africa's involvement in the drafting, as well as the final adoption of the Rome Statute, that led in many ways to the inclusion of certain crimes against humanity that were committed in South Africa, most notably the crime of apartheid itself. At the same time, South Africa has been instrumental in being a supporter of peace on the African continent, as well as a supporter of justice. Justice in its various forms, international justice in the way that we know it through the International Criminal Court, but also through uh, restorative justice, rehabilitative justice, and ultimately also through reconciliation. And so its involvement dates back to before the ICC was established. In many ways, one would argue that South Africa, at least historically, has been committed to the work of the International Criminal Court. Of course, as I will uh, later highlight in this presentation, things may have changed. When those, when those started to change is an issue that we will cover. In terms of South Africa's role quite specifically in peacemaking, and speaking very specifically to South Africa's role as a peacemaker in default, South Africa was involved and continues to be involved in the various peace initiatives uh, in the Sudans, not only in uh, now what is known as Sudan, but also in South Sudan, uh, attempting to broker peace in various forms and being instrumental in terms of some of the global peace agreements. At the same time, where those have failed or where efforts to establish peace have failed, South Africa has sought to involve itself in various commissions of inquiry, as well as looking into some of the crimes committed in the Sudans. Most notably, led by the former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, South Africa was integral in the African Union high-level panel into Defoe. The African Union high-level panel into, into Defoe made its recommendations in 2009. Amongst those recommendations were clear guidelines in terms of what needs to be done in the peace-building process. According to the AU high-level panel on Defoe, it wasn't just about establishing peace, it was about establishing a lasting peace. To that end, the high-level panel recommended that justice initiative also be considered. They thought about the idea of an ad hoc tribunal, a tribunal similar to what will now be established for South Sudan. That tribunal, since 2009, has not been established. At the same time, the ICC has indicted several Sudanese officials for their complicity in crimes committed in Defoe. This is something that has been contested by some South African officials, most notably the former president of South Africa himself, Thabo Mbeki, who chaired the high-level panel into Defoe. The question raised then is, should peace come first and then justice? But as conversations with a range of people show, Peace and justice are not competing narratives. In fact, establishing peace requires justice in the same way that justice requires a state of peace. These two things would ultimately have to work together. But that's really not the issue that we're dealing with, at least today. Speaking very specifically to al-Bashir's indictment, now, al-Bashir in many ways is the elephant in many rooms, not just the room of the South African government. Since 2009, when his first arrest warrant was issued for crimes against humanity and war crimes, there has been contestations in terms of how to deal with the, with the indictment of a sitting head of state. Most notably, 
how to deal with the issue of immunity of heads of state. It should be noted and, and understood that the UN Security Council referred the situation in Darfur, Sudan to the ICC in 2005 in terms of resolution uh, 1593 between 2005 and 2008, when there was no talk of indictment of al-Bashir, there were very little complaints in terms of the work of the International Criminal Court. In 2008, then a prosecutor of the International uh, Criminal Court, Luis Moreno Campo, announced that he would be indicting al-Bashir. It was on the back of this announcement, before the arrest warrants were issued, that contestations began. The issues, evolved from the issue of universal jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, its mandate in Darfur, but also whether it could indict a sitting head of state, bearing in mind that by 2008, the International Criminal Court had indicted other people in the, in the Darfur situation. And so in many ways, the contestations as to whether or not uh, the ICC should be in, in Darfur had more to do with who was indicted and less to do with what the issues were. It comes at a confluence of two deep issues for the African Union. The first is the impact on, peace, on the peace process in Darfur, and the second, issues around threats to sovereignty. These are not small issues. These are issues that the African Union has been tackling in various countries, bearing in mind that it has 54 member states. And with that, the African Union has sought to balance some of the issues. At the same time, criticism is there in terms of the complicity of the Sudanese government in the crimes committed in Darfur. The question then is whether or not all men are equal, except of course, if you're a sitting head of state. In that regard, al-Bashir has visited a number of states parties to the ICC, in addition to non-states parties. Most notably, and perhaps most controversially, and the country that we're discussing today, al-Bashir visited South Africa in June of 2015 for the African Union Summit in South Africa. His visit to the summit, which was something that many people did not expect, and the reason they didn't expect it, in 2009, ahead of Jacob Zuma's inauguration as president of the Republic of South Africa, the then director general in the, uh, in the Department of International Relations and Cooperation came forward to say, while they had extended an invitation to al-Bashir, they had warned him against traveling to South Africa because they would not be able to ensure that he wouldn't get arrested. The issue then was that a magistrate's court in Gauteng had issued an arrest warrant for al-Bashir on the basis of the ICC warrant. And much as the Department of International Relations felt that as a sitting head of state, al-Bashir should be invited to the summit, uh, to his inauguration, they also felt that the police would have to act on the arrest warrant. In 2009, al-Bashir did not come to South Africa. In 2013, when now the president of, Ke of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, was elected into office, the tune in terms of South Africa's view on immunities started to change. Most notably, in October of 2013, the president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, at an extraordinary summit of heads of state in Addis Ababa, announced in his view that the indictment of heads of state was in many ways going against sovereignty. He was, of course, speaking in respect of Uhuru Kenyatta's indictment, but obviously it also applies to al-Bashir both of whom had been indicted at the time. This was October of 2013. It was also at that summit that a range of African countries felt that if the ICC would not listen to them on the issue of immunities of heads of state, they would have no option but to pull out. A chorus that has been sung for the past three years. Most notably now in January of 2016 at the AU summit, something that was reiterated by the president of Kenya, talking about a roadmap to withdrawal, something that South Africa itself seems to be mulling. But in the midst of all of this, South African civil society led by the Southern African Litigation Center took the South African government to court. First on June 14, 2015, with regards to al-Bashir's presence in the country, the South South Southern African Litigation Center felt that the South African authorities should act and arrest al-Bashir. On the 14th of June, the High Court issued an indictment 
um, essentially saying that al-Bashir should not leave the country. On the 15th of June, again in court, the South African High Court then issued an arrest warrant. However, this arrest warrant was issued after al-Bashir had left the country. The South African government sought to appeal that decision. That decision eventually escalated itself to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And just two weeks ago in Bloemfontein, the Supreme Court of Appeal found that the South African government was not only, did not only act unlawfully, but it regarded its conduct at the High Court proceedings, but also its conduct in letting al-Bashir go as risible and against the law. This is high, this is very high criticism coming from the Supreme Court of Appeal. And so the question now for the South African government is what next? Has the position of the South African government changed in terms of immunity? What will the South African government say to the International Criminal Court when it must give its reasons under Article 87.7 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court? When the South African government, which I'm sure it will, takes this matter and appeal to the Constitutional Court, what will the argument there be? The Supreme Court of Appeal was of the opinion that the South African authorities have raised several arguments as to why al-Bashir should not have been arrested, but have said very little as to why they didn't act in respect of the High Court decision. In many ways, this is not just an issue of international law for South Africa. This is an issue for the rule of law in South Africa and an issue that many people are watching with bated breath. As I end my presentation and hand over to the question and answer segment, maybe another thing to be thinking about is the constitutional court decision tomorrow in respect of the Nkandla debacle. South Africa is dealing with many rule of law issues, international law related, domestic law related. The question then, which should be on people's minds, is are all men equal or some, maybe like you and I, not so equal? So there's possibly two. The first is looking at the Supreme Court of Appeal decision. It focuses very specifically on the al-Bashir issue. It focuses on the arrest warrant for al-Bashir. It focuses on South Africa's domestic law. What the Supreme Court of Appeal judges did not do was make a pronouncement on the true status of customary international law in South Africa. That is a basis on which the South African government can appeal in many ways to get clarity. An appeal to the Constitutional Court would put finality to this issue, at least on a legal basis. The second is that the South African government was requested to submit reasons to the ICC as to why they didn't arrest al-Bashir. In December of 2015, they argued that the reason they have not submitted their reasons is because they're waiting for the domestic process to finish. So in many ways, also saying they would appeal to the Constitutional Court buys them more time. It allows them to be able to then deal with the domestic issues before addressing the ICC. Of course, people would ask what reasons would the South African government give the ICC that are any different from the reasons they've given to the domestic courts? That's something we're yet to see. Now, talk of ICC withdrawal is not new. The talk of ICC withdrawal, um, as I mentioned earlier, started quite early. Uh, more recently, before this uh, recent talk of ICC withdrawal in October of 2013, there was a call for withdrawal. The only country that has made some steps towards withdrawal, significant steps towards withdrawal, was Kenya in September of 2013, when the parliament of Kenya voted for withdrawal, but the president has not assented to that withdrawal. The Namibian foreign minister has made remarks uh, suggesting that Namibia would withdraw because they have more pertinent priorities, they want to deal with poverty issues. But all of these are statements at this stage. There hasn't been, um, at least not yet, reports of actual efforts to withdraw. But for South Africa, because this was announced at the um, uh, African National Congress's National General Congress, um, there are questions that are raised as to whether they are very serious about this. And in fact, there are indications that South Africa could withdraw, but withdrawal won't be an easy task for them. There are bigger issues than just pulling out from the Rome Statute. They would also have to address domestic law concerns.
So first, South Africa having been a leader in terms of international criminal justice, in many ways could influence the decisions of other countries when it comes to withdrawal. Um, the fact that, for example, Namibia has already come forward to say they are considering withdrawal is something that should be taken um, with deep concern. At the same time, Tanzania has reaffirmed that it would not withdraw. Botswana similarly has reaffirmed its commitment to the International Criminal Court. The decision to withdraw ultimately rests with states themselves. While heads of state may be influenced by the views of their counterparts, for a lot of African countries, the decision to withdraw rests with their parliaments, and it is not a singularly executive function. That could be the saving grace for the International Criminal Court, in that while there's a lot of talk of withdrawal, there'll be very little action in terms of the withdrawal. But of course, that doesn't take away the possibility that withdrawal could still happen. That being said, the Rome Statute is very clear in terms of what it means to withdraw. Any country that withdraws from the Rome Statute is still bound by obligations that that country had at the time that it was a member state. And so withdrawal in many ways is a symbolic action. Withdrawal also means that later on, it wouldn't be bound in terms of cooperation. And so that would be, that would be the, the, the issue then in terms of those countries withdrawing. But ultimately, and, and this is perhaps a very important question, and thank you for posing it, Jemima, is do states really have to withdraw from the ICC? In many ways, using the assembly of states parties, there is room to constructively engage, but also critically engage with the structures of the International Criminal Court. If the issue here is the way in which the ICC is operating, it is, it is upon states to, to fix it. It is upon states to work together to ensure that the international criminal justice system serves the interests of all involved. And so withdrawing from the ICC may not be a solution because withdrawing from the ICC does not mean that referrals will not continue. Withdrawing from the ICC does not mean that the UN Security Council, for example, would not refer situations. And as we've seen, withdrawing from the ICC will not necessarily result in promoting the interests of peace over the interests of justice. And so withdrawing from the ICC, in my view, is not necessarily the solution. However, what is needed is constructive as well as critical engagement to better shape the international criminal justice landscape. It is about having conversations about how to make the ICC work better not just for Africans, but to work better as a universal court, which has universal jurisdiction. Instead of withdrawing from the ICC, African countries should be pushing for universal ratification of the International Criminal Court's Rome Statute.